It was in Burma, a sodden morning of the rains. A sickly light, like yellow tinfoil, was slanting over the high walls into the jail yard. We were waiting outside the condemned cells, a row of sheds fronted with double bars, like small animal cages. Each cell measured about ten feet by ten, and was quite bare within, except for a plank bed and a pot for drinking water. In some of them, brown, silent men were squatting at the inner bars, with their blankets draped round them. These were the condemned men, due to be hanged within the next week or so. So begins Eric Arthur Blair, or more popularly known as George Orwell, in his essay called A Hanging. Published in his 1945 Shooting an Elephant and Other Essays, with this essay, Orwell jumps right out of the gate and into the mouth of the beast. Partly an autobiography, based on his own experiences as a soldier in Burma during the 1920s as a British imperial police officer, Orwell wrote this essay a decade later, in 1931, as a reflection on his early years, while he was working as a private tutor to children and writing for the magazine Adelphi. He was 28 years old. As I said, partly this essay details Orwell's young life as a 19-year-old soldier in Asia, but partly also as a meditation on the concept of capital punishment. Listen as Orwell narrates how deeply that punishment affected him, and listen specifically to how he narrates, that is, describing a particular truth and reality paired with human experience through the lens of his own life, but speaking something greater in the process. It is curious, but till that moment, I had never realized what it means to destroy a healthy, conscious man. When I saw the prisoner step aside to avoid the puddle, I saw the mystery, the unspeakable wrongness of cutting a life short when it is in full tide. This man was not dying. He was alive, just as we are alive. All the organs of his body were working, bowels, digesting food, skin renewing itself, nails growing, tissues forming, all toiling away in solemn foolery. His nails would still be growing when he stood on the drop, when he was falling through the air with a tenth of a second to live. His eyes saw the yellow gravel and the gray walls, and his brain still remembered, foresaw, reasoned, reasoned even about the puddles, he and we were a party of men walking together, seeing, hearing, feeling, understanding the same world. And in two minutes, with a sudden snap, one of us would be gone. One mind less, one world less. Let's discuss why I am bringing this passage by George Orwell into the discussion right away. In our previous lecture, we discussed the importance of autobiography, how to craft your own life into words, how to select details that draw your reader towards your thesis, and the differences between a simplistic life sketch and an extended autobiography. What Orwell here is doing, this is more than an extended autobiography. For a moment, Orwell propels you outside of his own life into the pure world of action and ideas. He describes other people and what they are doing and projects himself as merely an observer, not a participant or even character in the story. In other words, Orwell becomes a narrator. Now, before we jump further into the lecture, I'd like to give you a warning. Some of the lectures I've done are participant-friendly, and this is another lecture where I will ask you to participate. For this lecture, I am going to ask you to do a bit of writing. 
Some of that writing will be done during the lecture, and some of that writing will be done after the lecture is completed. Please feel free to keep me updated on your progress and whether this is helpful or not, uh, but I do believe at least the disciplined process of writing will encourage you in a better direction. For today's lecture, I will be asking you to first outline some ideas for something you might write. And then at the end, I will be asking you to outline in detail the narration or story of what you will write. This will be an intensely personal session, so be prepared for that. You will experience emotions you probably would prefer not to experience in today's lecture. And I make no apologies for that. Experiencing ourselves in a new way is always part of growing up. But growing up is also about growing in. Learning about ourselves more by analyzing ourselves thinking deeply about the decisions we've made in our life, that has made us better or possibly broken us. How much you personally experience will be up to you. I'm sure there were many days between 1920 and 1930 that George Orwell said to himself, I can't write about the execution. That will be too painful of a memory to relive. He probably fought himself every day to push that experience further and further away until he finally knew what he wanted to say. It probably wasn't easy for him reliving that experience, especially because he was part of it. In his mind, he was the executioner, the one standing over the condemned man with the axe. He probably felt himself cut the rope, and sentenced that man to death, and it ate him alive for years. But he took himself out of himself for a moment so that he could put words to paper and so he could finally rid himself of that demon. The result, you can read for yourself. The story is quite easy to find online. Just type in George Orwell and a hanging into any search engine, and you'll find the full version. The point is, to find that thing you want to say will take not a small amount of bravery. So I am asking you to begin thinking about that. I will be asking you to take a turning point from your life and transform that into a story. You'll need to go deep into it. You will need to wrestle with your own personal demons if you want to compose a story that connects well to readers. However, your turning point doesn't need to be as dramatic as George Orwell's turning point. But your turning point does need to be poignant and meaningful, not sophomoric and saccharine. Now, let's jump into and learn about narration. Generally speaking, we have three kinds of narrations. The first kind of narration is dramatized narration. The second kind is generalized narration. And the third kind is summarized narration. The example I just read is a good reflection of dramatized narration, where you have characters interacting with one another between a series of events in which things are becoming progressively more drawn towards a thesis. Sometimes in dramatized narration, there is dialogue and the use of details. And more often than not, dramatized narration focuses on a single event rather than a series of events or a panorama of a life or lives. In the previous lecture, Peary Thomas's Down These Mean Streets was a great example of dramatized narration as well. Generalized narration, on the other hand, 
narrates events and attitudes of a particular place, uh, person, or time. And summarized narration condenses incidents without the use of detail to provide a concise report of a series of incidents. Listen to a wonderful example of both generalized and concise narrative. You should notice a few things when listening to this. Firstly, the lack of dryness. This passage is not boring. Also, you should notice the emphasis on personality. The author, Benjamin Franklin, is not afraid to talk about his own opinions or ideas. I had a strong inclination for the sea, but my father declared against it. However, living near the water, I was much in and about it, learned early to swim well and to manage boats. And when in a boat or canoe with other boys, I was commonly allowed to govern, especially in any case of difficulty. And upon other occasions, I was generally a leader among the boys and sometimes led them into scrapes of which I will mention one instance, as it shows an early projecting public spirit, though not then justly conducted. There was a salt marsh that bounded part of the mill pond, on the, ed on the edge of which, at high water, we used to stand to fish for minnows. By much tramping, we had made it a mere quagmire. My proposal was to build a wharf there, fit for us to stand upon, and I showed my comrades a large heap of stones, which were intended for a new house near the marsh, and which would very well suit our purpose. Accordingly, in the evening, when the workmen were gone, I assembled a number of my playfellows, and working diligently like so many emmets, sometimes two or three to a stone, we brought them all away and built our little wharf. The next morning, the workmen were surprised at missing the stones which were found in our wharf. Inquiry was made after the removers. We were discovered and complained of. Several of us were corrected by our fathers, and though I pleaded the usefulness of the work, mine convinced me that nothing was useful which was not honest. Notice the lack of Benjamin Franklin's dramatic narration. He uses virtually no dialogue, no imagery, no figurative language, no alliterative language, and yet we, as the observers to the story, are intrigued by Franklin's audacity in leading a group of boys to pilfer a construction site to build their own playground. The language also contains a style of narration which exudes a sense of propriety or standards of behavior, while also praising the playfulness of children, exploring the geography of early America, and trying to teach a valuable lesson about a new kind of work ethic that Franklin wished his readers would emulate. For the first exercise in this lecture, you are going to choose one turning point from your life. One of the turning points that we discussed in the previous lecture about autobiography. You should take the concise narration from your mind regarding that turning point and now rewrite it as a descriptive narration. To do this, you will need to make a table of the elements of that turning point. <clears throat> Who was there? Obviously, you were there. But often the first impulse when writing about our own lives is to exclude anyone else who was there. This is like an untrained muscle in your brain. You don't even realize you are excluding others from your own life. And when you write about your life in a journal, for example, you will write about an event without even thinking of the effect others are having on you. So. When writing about this turning point, let's use the example of an exam. You'll want to mention everyone who was there, even those you feel were not significant. Your teacher, 
the teacher's assistant, the monitor of the class, the specific student sitting around you, minding their own business, but nevertheless expressing a particular pressure on you, your parents looming at the back of your mind the entire time, the sound of your uncle's voice laughing at you, the look of your tutor still shaking his head in disappointment. And that's just for the 10 minutes you are sitting at that desk taking the test. Your event may be composed of several scenes, your dorm before the test, the walk to the testing building, the test, and the walk to a little park by a lake. And each of those four scenes will contain multiple people exerting specific effects on, onto you and creating a much more complex image. When did it take place? Turning points exist between two different selves of you, the you before and the you after the turning point. The transformation occurs at a specific time for a particular reason. So you want to describe the significance of this event in terms not only of your life, but also in terms of the history of what is happening around you. Major events in your life major events in your family, major events in your community, major events in your village or town, major events in your city, major events in your province or state, and even major events occurring within your country. Move outward from yourself in the small to the nation in the big. And you may notice some very interesting things you've never seen before. You may also recall details that up until now you've forgotten. Posters on the street, comments from acquaintances, even things like the color of clothing that people around you wore or the slang they used in offhanded conversations. Where did it take place? Describe the setting as detailed as you can or are willing to, especially the aspects of that place that directly had a relationship with you. Outline the location of the event three-dimensionally in your mind. Not only the room, but the building, as well as the artificial and natural environment. Notice the little details of the setting the color of the walls, the feel of the wooden desk, the weather outside, the temperature in the room, the noisiness outside in the halls, the wind blowing the trees beyond the window, and whether the tree outside was shedding leaves or had new spring buds. You'll want to carefully consider the setting just as we discussed in our previous lecture about setting. But the tighter your event occurs and the shorter time it exists in, the more importance the setting plays in how you narrate and describe the turning point. What happened? What was the sequence of events that occurred from beginning to end for that event? For this scripting, you want to structure the event in terms of story beats or dialectics. A story beat is composed of two key elements, action and reaction, also known as A and B, where A is the action and B is the reaction. For this exercise, just note down the sequence of events. Don't worry about dialogue or writing down the exact story yet. We will get to that in a later exercise today. But you should have a solid structure of what happened first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and so on. And make sure to set up each sequence with an action-reaction relationship, or if A, then B. You may find yourself redoing this exercise several times, 
each time going deeper and deeper into the micro levels of what actually happened. If you are doing that, then you are doing this correctly. How did that event change your life physically? Emotionally? Intellectually? Philosophically? Spiritually? This part of the exercise is the most esoteric and difficult part, because you know by the end of your turning point, you'll need to incorporate most or all of these changes into your writing. But these changes are also the most important part of your turning point. For example, maybe you had fear before the test, but after you were no longer afraid. This is a feeling inside of you and cannot really be described beyond your feelings, but you'll need to. In the writing, you'll infuse parts of your narration with these feelings, such as describing the tree outside the window as cold, shivering, the leaves nervous about floating off into the wind, or the clouds beyond the windows frozen, Gray monoliths hanging in the sky, never changing, casting a heavy afternoon shadow over the street. Then, at the end of the narration, you'll describe the transformation through your own experience, feeling the lightness of the breeze in the hallway brush against your face, or seeing dim, sunlit shadows across the cheek of your friend who is waiting for you outside in the halls. And you just burst into smiles and laughter, the light on your friend's face peeling off and shocking your own cold skin like a ray of sunlight. These feelings you will describe in your narration, but first you must recognize what those changes were before you can do this properly. You should take some time now to process your thoughts. When you are ready, Come back to the lecture and we will continue. All stories must have a beginning, middle, and end. Generally, when we discuss story, we consider the example of Aristotle's incline. Aristotle's incline consists of an overlapping set of eight elements. On the lower level, we have three acts, Act 1, Act 2, and Act 3. Within Act 1, we have the opening scene of the story. Within Act 2, we have the midpoint of the story. And within Act 3, we have the wrap-up of the story. The opening scene sets the tone of the story. The characters are introduced, the mood is established, the setting is confirmed, and the problem is stated. The midpoint is a transformative moment in the story. We can think of this in two ways for the sake of our lecture today. Each turning point in your life could serve as the midpoint for a story of your life. Or if you are writing about just a single turning point, then the midpoint is the moment of transformation when you actually do take the turn and begin the transformation into something else before the most difficult part of your experience occurs. <clears throat> for the sake of our lecture today, you'll think of the latter. And the midpoint of your writing, at least for this exercise, will be that moment of turn or transformation. The wrap-up is the sweet moment at the end when a realization about life emerges and meaning is established. The wrap-up occurs after the climax of the story, after, through some sacrifice, victory has been achieved. The wrap-up is often the most difficult to write because no one's story is really ever over. 
but the story does always contain a final period. Then, between Act 1 and Act 2, the story contains what is known as the first plot point, or plot point 1. Plot point 1 is the first major problem in a story. Any good story will have three problems that occur. The first problem, when the tranquility of life is broken. The second problem, when a demand is made of a person to change. And the third problem, when the person must struggle and conquer something. These problems reflect the way we, or humans, struggle and overcome problems in life. So, naturally, our stories should reflect that, but in a more systematic and clarifying way. So, the first plot point is the first problem. Again, this occurs between Act 1 and Act 2. The second plot point, or plot point 2, occurs between Act 2 and Act 3. This problem is the climax of the story, when the point-of-view person or character in the story encounters the most difficult situation. A story isn't a story when there isn't something to overcome. Many people fail to write excellent stories because they don't have excellent problems to overcome. Eating an apple isn't interesting unless there is a worm inside it. Otherwise, it's just eating an apple and not feeling hungry anymore. Taking a test isn't interesting unless you feel powerless in your ability to pass that test, but then you find an inner power inside of yourself to push through and overcome that challenge. So, in summary, when using Aristotle's incline to craft a story, you have Act 1, which includes the opening scene. Then you have the first big problem, or plot point 1, which introduces the reader for Act 2. In Act 2, you have the second problem, <clears throat> also known as the midpoint, when the point-of-view character decides to turn or transform. <clears throat> Then there is a climax known as plot point two, or the biggest problem in the story. After solving the biggest problem, you have act three, which includes the wrap-up. In the wrap-up, you'll write about how the world is different now. While in regular essays, you can get away with a hook, introduction, point paragraphs, refutation, and conclusion. Telling stories is a little trickier and contains more dimensions to them. Telling the story of your own turning point with descriptive narration will take more effort than just describing it with generalized or summarized narration. Not only do you need to have a hook or opening scene, but you also need to have the following elements for a successful personal story. <clears throat> you'll need to have an established mood. You communicate mood through the choice of language you use, especially the figurative and alliterative language you employ. Choosing to use overly flowery, flowery words will emphasize a mood of exquisite beauty, distant from normal people. Choosing to use brisk and short words will indicate a mood of action, discreteness, and clarity. Choosing to use many descriptions of color will transform your mood into a vibrant, and exciting, and perhaps a bit too much drama. While choosing to use a lot of exposition without description will elicit a mood of academic rigor, dryness, and a lack of sensitivity to the world around the people in the narrative. You'll need to establish a theme. Think of a theme like the collection of ideas in your story having something in common. 
For example, if you are writing a story about taking a test, you might describe the setting or the university, school, or testing center as being on edge with students sweating, teachers walking the halls while shuffling papers quickly between their fingers, a new clock on the wall telling time perfectly, bare white walls like skeleton bones, even the trees outside totally naked of leaves and color, just brown bones against a gray, gloomy sky. <clears throat> You'll also need to choose the kind of narrative you wish to pursue. In addition to the three kinds of narration we discussed before, that being descriptive narration, generalized narration, and concise narration, we also have two approaches to narration. The first approach is known as the narrative summary, which covers a large segment of time, skips over events, and aims for broad, comprehensive impressions in the minds of readers rather than using detailed visions of discrete scenes. Even if you are using descriptive narration as a technique, you may also choose to use narrative summary to briefly introduce the reader to what is going on before you jump directly into the scene. The narrative summary is not the same as generalized narration or concise narration. If you remember from earlier, a generalized narration is describing typical events and typical attitudes using words like much, commonly, generally, and sometimes, while concise narration is even more brief, just a basic report of an event without any details. Alternatively, you might decide to use in media res, thrusting the reader directly into the middle of the event, a technique used in the second narrative approach, the narrative moment. Using the narrative moment exposes the reader to a limited time frame. Exploring that limited time frame in all its detail, relying on characters, dialogue, plot, and concrete sensory language. While the narrative moment and descriptive narration work very well together, sometimes you'll want a larger canvas to write about, and you'll want to explore more than a single moment. Nevertheless, these approaches you can use when deciding how to frame your story. For the second exercise of this lecture, you will take the sequence of events you already prepared and place those events into Aristotle's incline. Let's rewind and make sure we are all following correctly. The task for this lecture is to take a turning point in your life and transform that into a narrative experience for a reader. A turning point was the time in your life when you decided to change and transform into something else. As we discussed before, we all have many turning points in our lives. However, not all of those turning points would be interesting to other people. For this lecture, you want to take that turning point you feel would be the most interesting to a reader and describe what happened. You will do this by applying the techniques you learned through these lectures and putting words on paper that create emotional resonance in readers. The techniques we have been studying through these lectures cannot be practiced in a vacuum. They must be linked to an exciting and interesting story. However, Remember when I said not all of your turning points may be interesting to other people? Your first reaction will always be, wow, this, this is a really difficult decision. My life is just not that interesting. In fact, the truth is the opposite. 
most of your life is actually very interesting. But your ability to tell a good story is the difference between those stories being interesting to readers. Hopefully you remember earlier when I told part of Orwell's story, when he described what it was like to be a policeman in Burma in the 1920s, when he witnessed an execution. Yeah. Most of us haven't witnessed people being killed. Clearly for Orwell, that experience was a turning point. But neither you nor I have those kinds of experiences. Does that mean you can't tell an interesting story out of something that for most people is quite boring or uninteresting? Not at all. Before we jump into this exercise, I'd like you to listen to another part of a story from the author Ian Frazier in his book On the Res. Here, Ian is talking about something that almost every one of us has experienced. Watching a dance. But when he watches the dance, something inside him changes and shifts forward. Here, Ian Fraser is going to describe a Native American dance known as a powwow. For Native Americans, powwows were more than dances. They were spiritual experiences in which normal people like you or me became empowered with the ability to perform superhuman feats. However, while much of that has been lost in the modern era, listen to how the experience transforms Fraser, in particular. Listen for the if A, then B, or the action-reaction moment of this part of his little story. <clears throat> Elaborately feathered dancers entered the powwow circle for the men's traditional dance competition. The crowd of spectators standing behind the rows of lawn chairs grew, and those in back couldn't really see. The view from there reminded me of a crowded exhibition of famous paintings I went to once in a museum in New York City. Occasionally, a gap in the throng would occur, and through it come a dazzling glimpse of color and form. Then the ranks would close, and all you could see was the backs of people's heads again. At a less crowded spot, I worked my way to the front. The dancers were all going counterclockwise, each dancing as if alone, stepping to the drum music, some crouching down low. All of them had numbers pinned on like those worn by rodeo riders or distance racers. The powwow judges would award cash and other prizes to the best dancers in each category and subcategory. A dancer came right up by me. He was a big man. And in his costume, turkey feather bustle three feet across, feathered anklets, feathered gauntlets, beaded headband, tall roach made of a porcupine tail atop his head. He seemed magnified in every dimension, always a spirit being. Then I saw the wristwatch he had on beneath the gauntlet and the sweat on his temple, and the concentration in his eyes. Now, I wanted to be someplace quiet and empty. I maneuvered through the crowd, went by the taco and lemonade stands, out the gate in the chain-link fence, through the field full of parked cars. The carnival had shut down, and the rock and roll no longer played. And only once, and, and only one generator still purringly ran. I walked to downtown Pine Ridge, past the tribal building, up the hill to the old hospital, and then onto the open field of the path the doctors walk on. I went half a lap around it and sat down. The grass was damp. Dew had begun to fall. I could hear the amplified voice of the announcer at the powwow. Then his voice stopped, and the only sound was the singing and drumming. 
It came through the darkness, high and strong and wild, as if blown on the wind. It could have been ten voices singing, or it could have been a thousand. At moments, it sounded like other night noises, coyotes or mosquitoes, or like a sound the land itself might make. I imagined what hearing this would have done to me if I were a young man from Bern, Switzerland, say, traveling the prairie wilderness for the first time in 1843. I knew it would have scared and thrilled me to within an inch of my life. Did you notice how important the setting was to Fraser's story? Did you notice how important time was to his story? What about characters? More importantly, did you notice the A and B rhythm of his story? Of him experiencing the powwow, being overwhelmed, and then retreating to a place outside the carnival where he could just calm down and experience a form of enlightenment as a result of that experience. So, your task now is to take all of those if A, then B events or action reaction events of your turning point and paste them into the incline. Opening scene, plot point one, midpoint, plot point two, and wrap up. Then put additional scenes in between each of those five sections so that act one, act two, and Act 3 feel full. Talk about the why, that is, your thesis, and then talk about the who, the when, the where, the what, and the how, using the details from your brainstorm to describe the scene in which your turning point takes place. Good luck. <laughs>